we have this voice right now. You could say to yourself, hmm, maybe I'll go for a walk, right? <laughs> You're talking to yourself all the time, but you see it as, as part of you, right? And it's one of the things that you use to solve problems and think through what's going on and go about your day, right? You use it. Well, what if you didn't think that that voice in your head was part of you? I recently finished reading a very interesting book. It's called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. Sounds like a crazy title, but I want to just give a quick review of the book because I found it very interesting. I read that Richard Dawkins said about the book, it's either a work of genius or it's complete rubbish, <laughs> nothing in between. It's either genius or it's rubbish. I, I kind of agree with that. It's either true or it's not true. And if it's true, that's extremely interesting. But what is it? What is extremely interesting? Okay, so I'm gonna kind of give a review, but also talk a little bit about what the book covers. And I didn't find it particularly hard to read I think it's worth picking up if you find the ideas interesting. I'll do my best to kind of talk through what I think the basic ideas in the book are to give you a sense, okay? So first, we have to accept that language is kind of primary in the mind. The basic idea is that language was the vehicle for us human beings to develop consciousness. But that language became or came before consciousness, that we actually had language far before we had what we now call consciousness. And he also says that consciousness is, is not what most people think. It's not all of our awareness or our ability to use speech or a sense of maybe experiencing the taste of chocolate. It's, that's not what it is. Consciousness is the ability to have a sort of flashlight of awareness that we point at different things, right? And that feeling of being a kind of self standing back, able to sort of reflect on uh, our lives and look at different things in the mind, that's, that's what consciousness is, right? It's a narrower definition of consciousness than I think some other people would have. But getting back to the language thing. So imagine language as a landscape that exists in the mind and the things in the landscape are objects and those objects are like metaphors for real things so first there are real things and then we have a word for those real things and the word for those real things lives in the mental landscape as a metaphor like a real thing <laughs> but once it's a metaphor then it can be used in different ways so let's say for example the word heart okay so the word heart is a word which is meant to kind of represent a heart, let's say, our heart, right? But once you have the word heart in your mind landscape, your language mind landscape, then you can do other things with it. It doesn't have to just now represent that thing, that mean that thing. It can now be used metaphorically for other things. We say, the heart, get to the heart of the issue, right? My heart is burning. Is it really? We're using it to, to do other things. So language, in a way, in the mind, originally representing actions and things, becomes this new landscape where things are a little more flexible. We can do more with them. Okay, so that's language. And then we start to we start to develop an ability to use language that feels like speech from someone else, but is only in our heads. So this is the second part of it. So we're using language and we're still not conscious, by the way. 
We're not fully conscious in the way that modern humans are conscious, but we're still using language to communicate. We're building cities, civilizations. We're getting things done. We're telling people what to do. We're telling people to go here and go there and do that and take this and give me that. Right? We're, we're communicating, but still not fully conscious, according to, according to Julian Jaynes. According to him, at some point, we started to hear a voice in our head using language like a person would use language, telling us what to do. And he says that this voice would have been probably the voice of the king. So the king is the person who has authority in your city or where you live, right? And the king says, says, Build me a pyramid, or uh, from now on, if you steal a cow, you'll, your uh, arms will be chopped off, right? Or uh, go to war with that, that tribe, or whatever, right? So the voice of the king is an authority. But the interesting thing that happened is, okay, so you have the king, and he, he speaks, he uses language. When he speaks, and he tells you to do something, you do it because he's the king, right? But then, one day the king dies... The weird thing that happens is the king's voice is still in your head, except that voice in your head is now, because you, you remember his voice, is now still telling you to do things, but coming from you, <laughs> right? Except you don't recognize it as you. You recognize it as the voice of God or some powerful being talking to you, telling you what to do, right? So now, okay, so we have language. Then a language is, allows us to communicate, to talk about things, to communicate instructions. We have this mental landscape in our minds, right? And then, because we have language now, we have societies and civilizations, and then we have kings who can tell us what to do. But then their voices don't have to die when they die. So we start, for example, offering flowers and fruit to the king after he dies. That's why we see in these uh, burial sites where kings were buried, these fruit offerings and, uh, and gold and jewelry and flowers to, to still pay respect to the king, even though his body is dead. Why? Because his voice is still alive in your head telling you what to do. So you don't recognize that voice as coming from you. You recognize it as coming from the outside. But because it's the voice of the king, you still do it because you, you associate that voice with a command, right? Go to war, <laughs> fight with them, kill them, eat that, <laughs> right? You recognize the voice as an authority telling you what to do. And so when you hear that voice, you do that thing. Hear voice, do thing. There's no distinction. There's no thought of, oh, I heard a voice that told me to go to war uh, with the Hittites. <laughs> no, the voice is an authority voice that's telling me what to do. And as soon as I hear it, I do it because I recognize it as the voice of God, right? So this is, again, this is his theory, okay? So now, but what is the voice? Well, the voice is using, it's, it's our minds right? Using that voice, but actually it's our problem-solving brain, right? Squirrels can solve problems, figure out how to get the nuts out of the jar. Crows, animals, you know, are good at pro solving, solving problems. It's just that now that problem-solving brain has developed <laughs> a voice, <laughs> like an AI, right? That now has a voice. Oh, I can tell him what to do. Instead of just figuring s s stuff out, kind of blindly now we have directions do that eat this go there right so that's a new thing but again we don't recognize it as coming from us it's from the outside it's a command okay so this is this is what's called the bicameral mind this is where where everything is happening from commerce and trade to writing books, stories, without 
an inner voice that we recognize as our own and what we have today, modern day consciousness. Without that, we can do all of that without consciousness. In fact, he uses the story Homer's Iliad as proof of this. He notes in the Iliad, which is a you know, classic, uh, uh, a very early form of literature, he notes that in the Iliad, every you, you never have characters in the Iliad sitting down thinking, geez, you know, I wonder what I should do. I, I guess I could do this. You never have characters sitting down exhibiting what we have as conscious reflection. Where we kind of step back in our minds and look at our options, consider ourselves as an agent that could go left or right in the future. Reading the Iliad, the language of the Iliad, the gods decide everything. The god decided this, the god decided that. So it's written as that. So he believes that the Iliad is essentially proof of the bicameral mind, that even the person, even Homer had this had this bicameral mind he wrote the iliad with the concept that the voices of god were telling people what to do and it wasn't people deciding things on on their own it was the voice of god that's his idea he, he uses that as evidence to support it very interesting okay then we have and of course then it's immediate obedience right you hear the voice you do the thing voice says do thing you do thing right so so we have this voice right now. You could say to yourself, hmm, maybe I'll go for a walk, right? <laughs> You're talking to yourself all the time, but you see it as, as part of you, right? And it's one of the things that you use to solve problems and think through what's going on and go about your day, right? You use it. Well, what if you didn't think that that voice in your head was part of you? That's what we're talking about, okay? Then we get to the breakdown. So the origin of consciousness. Up to this point, consciousness does not exist, essentially. The, what we have now, this, this conscious awareness, this flashlight that can reflect and move around and consider ourselves uh, as a separate thing that might do different things in the future, for example, uh, doesn't exist. But we have all the pieces there right? But then a series of catastrophes take place and there are large migrations of people across other lands and territories and a lot of mixing of people. And in this mixing of people, you have the, the voices no longer agreeing. So people from another place are now moving into my territory and what their voices are telling them to do is that's very different than what from my voices are telling me to do, right? Our voices are telling us two different things. It starts to create this problem where people begin to realize that this voice, not a conscious realization, but it's it, the voices kind of start canceling each other out, basically, right? And as they do that, we develop a new capacity, which is now to still have the voice, but to, in a sense, in our minds, step back a little bit and see the voice as part of our minds presenting options about what to do, which then gives you a new kind of agency, right? Before the voice said, do that, and you do that. Now, a voice in your head says, I could have raspberries or blueberries, <laughs> right? And you you consider that. You, you look at yourself in a different way. Now, the voice is proposing things to you, right? Like, what about this or what about that? Rather than commanding you, you see the voice as something that helps you, but isn't telling you exactly what to do, right? You don't see it as separate from yourself. It's part of you, right? And that's what we do now, right? We, our inner voice, we don't even think about our inner voice. It's just kind of there, right? I, I've heard that some people don't, don't have one, which I find weird, but a lot of people have an inner voice and it's just part of their process of going about their day, getting things done, doing things, making decisions, right? Solving problems. And so now 
the problem solving brain, which before used the proxy voice to command is now the problem solving brain using the voice to sort of create a more total experience of looking at the whole situation a little bit more broadly and that ability to look at the situation a little more broadly is consciousness according to Julian Jaynes. Okay, so that's the breakdown of the bicameral mind. The breakdown is when we lose the command and we gain the new, that new ability, right, to, to step back for lack of a better way to say it. All right, so then he goes into support for this and there are a lot of things he talks about but two interesting examples hypnosis and poetry hypnosis and poetry so what so there was a guy named mesmer and he was very interested in first magnetism but then he he developed the technique of hypnosis which is a well-documented thing that allows one person to not take control of another person to to tap into a condition of another person that makes them more suggestible. Some people are easy to hypnotize, some people aren't, right? And those who are easier to hypnotize will do what you tell them to do. If you say, cluck like a chicken, they'll do it. If you say, there is no chair there, then they won't see a chair there. <laughs> <laughs> if you say everyone around you is a scary ghost, you will act like everyone around you is a scary ghost and you'll really believe it. So he's, Julian Jaynes says, this is proof that we have this obedient personality inside. This is, this is a sort of leftover thing from the bicameral mind. Before, during the period of the bicameral mind, it was the voice hypnotizing the person. So a constant state of hypnosis, basically, all day the voice telling you what to do. And that would have just felt normal. But now you have to be hypnotized before and we kind of revert to that state where the, the thing that tells us what is going on in the world turns off and that slot is taken over by the hypnotist. And when they say cluck like a chicken, we just... I'll obey it immediately. We just do that thing, cluck like a chicken. And we don't recognize it as weird or strange. And he says it's the only valid explanation of hypnosis. I think that's pretty interesting, right? Why why would be why would anyone be capable of being hypnotized? It's such a weird thing, right? But the other thing is the the brain, the parts of the brain that keep keep us safe, for example, they're still on. So that's why under hypnosis, people don't do things that will hurt themselves. If a hypnotist, hypnotist says, says, walk off a cliff, uh, people don't do it. For some reason, they can't do it, or maybe they can't move. Or the hypnotist says, there's no chair there, okay, and then you don't see a chair there. There isn't a chair there. You don't recognize a chair being there. But then the hypnotist says, walk straight, and the path straight would be through a chair. You don't see the chair and yet your body makes you walk around the chair. <laughs> you still avoid the chair, even though in, you're consciously, you're not aware of the chair because under suggestion, under, under hypnosis, you don't see it. That's really interesting. That's very cool support. He also talks about schizophrenia and he talks about poetry. The poetry part is really interesting. He thinks that poetry, like the Iliad, would have been initially the the written language, written or spoken language of God. So poetry emphasizes sort of capturing emotions. Poetry is a heightened speech that's separate from mundane speech, like talking about how was work today? Right? How did you, did you uh, hurt any sheep? I don't know what people talked about then, but in the bicameral era. But Poetry as heightened speech meant that the poets were and were sort of capturing the voices of gods. And when people heard poetry, they were kind of hearing the voice of God. And a lot of ancient religious texts, for example, why are they written in poetry? Because they were capturing the, the divine voice. And that's why Part of why religion is so powerful for people is that there is this ancient connection between poetry 
and the voice of God, which is separate from ordinary speech and ordinary writing. That's also very interesting. I have no idea if it's true, of course, but I think it's really interesting as a theory, and I really enjoyed the book. So if you want to, that was a basic summary based on my understanding of it, uh, but if you want to read it yourself, I would be very curious to hear your thoughts. If you agree with it, if you disagree with it, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But it's, I think it's not that hard to read. So check it out. Let me know what you think. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And feel free to get a free course in the links in the description. <music>